Hey, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, um, like I already mentioned, I'd like to, you to go to the book of James. James is a little tiny book near the very end of the Bible, um, and it is the book we're going to be spending the next three months on. And uh, if you weren't with us last week, I want to encourage you, there's um, a really cool video that kind of gives the framework of the whole thing. You can find that at the Bible Project. So I think we have the, uh, you can either go to thebibleproject.com and just get it off their website, or you can get the, download the app. It's a very cool app that gives you summaries of all the books of the Bible, and it's a great way to kind of get a framework for where we're going. And uh, I, I think it's kind of cool that we get to listen to the half-brother of Jesus um, as we kind of celebrate 2024, as we get going on all this. And um, we're going to just be going through the first 12 verses of this book today. So we have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in. Verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, unlike most of the stories that we read, or even the what they call the epistles in the Bible, they're usually written very specifically to a group of people, like to the Ephesians, to the Corinthians, to, you know, and it's to the Galatians. They're, they're writing to specific churches. This one, though, James, or we learn from the Bible Project, his actual name would have been Jacob. Um, he's writing to basically all the followers of Jesus in all the different locations all around who are scattered. And again, if you understand being an occupied people group, it makes sense why he's doing this. He's like, no, I want to hit everyone because they really are scattered everywhere. Now, I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, oh, we don't really think about this, but could you imagine being the brother of Jesus? Okay, think about this for a second. Can you imagine getting into arguments knowing every time you don't win? That you're always wrong. Can you imagine? But on the other side, can you imagine what it'd be like to learn from someone who has the wisdom of God himself? How unique that would be, how special that would be. In fact, we know that James so believed in what his brother was and was about that he was incredibly wooed by him. The fact that James would write a book of the Bible celebrating what his brother taught tells us something about who Jesus is. James was willing to carry on Jesus' legacy because he knew Jesus. Think about this. James, also known as James the Just historically, um, was ultimately martyred for his faith. He was stoned to death. And if you don't know what that is, and we're not talking like stone, like stone. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's stone uh, where they took rocks, baseball-sized, softball-sized rocks, and they threw them at you until you were crushed to death. Can you imagine how brutal that would be? He so believed in his brother, he would never relent from the truth that he saw. That's pretty amazing. James' story is a story of commitment. James led the early church through some really rough times. In fact, we saw this on the video last week that they went through a terrible famine in Jerusalem. He led them through that. They, they went through a lot of religious persecution because they were this little sect that we would someday know as Christianity. They were, they were known as the way back then. And they were so, so poorly thought of that they were persecuted all the time. Yet despite that, James has perspective on trials that eludes most of us today. And I would say this, I think in America today, we need to hear what James says about how to deal with difficulties, okay? This is counter-cultural. Verse 2, and it, just the first four words will tell you, he says, consider it pure joy, pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Again, who's James talking to? He says, brothers and sisters. He's referring to all Christians everywhere. That would include us. And his intention is to tell us that we can be made perfect despite the chaos of this world. I have to be honest with you, I, I struggle with this. 
This last year was a huge trial for me. I would have loved to say that I reacted in pure joy. <laughs> I did not. I struggled. And yet what I came to discover was that God rebuilt me. He allowed me to face significant trials, and ultimately, he develops my perseverance. We don't like that, though, do we? I think somewhere along the line, I, I started to ask the question, why? Why this change? God, what are you doing? And I still can't say that I fully understand this, but I think a huge part of this was to build my character and help me identify with others more completely. And here's the bottom line lesson that I've finally been able to put words to. In order to get through hard trials, we need to consider another way. I think the word that captured me the most in this was consider it pure joy. Consider it. We don't like to consider it when we're mad. We don't like to consider it when we're angry. We don't like to consider it when we're betrayed. We don't like to consider anything at all when we feel like we've been violated in any way. But what the scripture is teaching us is that we need to step back from our anger, our frustration, and our annoyance and say, wait a minute. Could there be something bigger, maybe even better going on here that we never thought of in the first place? And then, and this is what blows me away, God can give an outcome that we cannot give by ourselves. Joy. Joy. Smooth water. God wants to develop us into joyful creatures, and James tells us how. Let's perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Have you ever thought that maybe the reason I'm going through this trial, maybe the reason that I have this incredible health difficulty, Maybe this reason I have this overwhelming business problem, maybe the reason I have this relational chaos is because God is actually trying to do something for me to grow me into something more complete and better. We don't think that way, so consider it. Consider that maybe God has something better for you and you have to go through the difficulty in order to grow you up. Because here's what I've noticed we do. We look for justification or even fairness but what we need to do is persevere in order to discover joy with God. That is not the way our world thinks, is it? We want to stop the pain. We want the problem to go away. We want the trial to neatly disappear. But is that how God works? Or is there more? James would claim there's so much more to learn from trials that growth happens in the middle of chaos. And church, I need this. You need this. This is life. Heed James' warning. It matters how we respond to trials. And if you're wondering, oh yeah, that's great, Todd. It's nice for James to say that, but I'm in the middle of one right now, and how in the world am I to move forward? Well, he actually has a solution for that. Keep going. Look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, it's very simple, you should ask God. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to move forward, if you're not sure what path to take, if you feel a lump in your gut and you feel trapped, ask God for wisdom. That's it. Ask him. See, what this verse says is that God gives wisdom without shaming you, blaming you, or ridiculing you. He won't give you wisdom only if you've done life right. On the contrary, God will give you wisdom even when you've screwed everything up. This is one of the most comforting verses in the Bible. And this is coming from the brother of Jesus, so I'm pretty confident he knows what he's talking about. And what does he say God's going to be like? Is he going to be stingy, reluctant, passive? Avoid? No. It says he will be generous. Generous with wisdom. Church, too often, we do not have because we do not ask. I love this verse in the Bible. We need wisdom. It says if we ask, he will give, and I love this word, 
generously. Generously. This is the kindness of God expressed to us. This is so good. Yet what I have observed in life is that God is more than willing to give wisdom. He's more than willing to share the way to go. But so often, we would rather control than let God do what God is capable of doing. And so even if the wisdom's available, even if the wisdom's there, we still say no to it because we want our will to be done, not his. And I believe that's why James gives conditions of the asking for wisdom in verses 6 through 8. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. God, will you recover my marriage, even though I don't want to follow your ways for living and loving a spouse, and I doubt they're ever going to change, but God, could you change them? God, will you give me business success, even though I've been having some kind of you know, practices, but everybody else does, so it's okay, right, Lord? No big deal. God, will you restore my relationship with my child, even though I don't care about my kids, because I've prayed for them before and nothing's happened. When we doubt, we ignore God, abandon his ways, and refuse to follow his commands. We're same with our actions in essence. I do what I want to do, and my Santa wish giver in the sky would simply do my bidding, then I'd be happy. That's not faith. That's religious arrogance with a narcissistic twist. Double-minded means you go back and forth and have no true spiritual anchor. That you do what you want regardless of what you claim, and you only trust God part-time. And of course, that appears as unstable and everybody can see it. James says the unstable, double-minded person will not receive anything from the Lord. I, I don't know the answer to this, but I was wondering... Does that mean God doesn't, answer, doesn't offer wisdom to, at all to a person because God knows they won't do anything with it? Perhaps. That makes a ton of sense to me. Or does this mean God still offers wisdom? It's available to all believers. But when you are unstable in your mind because of your doubt or unbelief, you can't possibly take in the wisdom because wisdom can't take root in an unstable environment. I don't know the answer. Either way, without faith, we can't have wisdom. Through his spirit, God provides wisdom and insight that can't be manufactured or learned in the natural world. No matter how much you know, no matter what type of expert you are in your field, you will be better and more equipped when you have godly wisdom. It changes things. My existence here tells that story. I mentioned this last month, but my first reaction, my flesh, fleshly reaction to this transition was to run. I wanted to go to another part of the country to start over, but God had other plans, better plans. In faith, God showed me that here was best. And I'd like to highlight that for a moment, because this guy says it's been a really fun run. I mean, you think about this church now, four months old. Four months. You realize now we have over 344 people have come and visited us in four months. We started doing a database three months ago, and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of people. On Christmas Eve, we had 240 people come and join us to celebrate the goodness of who God is here in this space. I'm going, wow, my friend of mine who is a church planting guru on the west side said, you've got to quit calling yourself a church plant. You already have more people than 85% of churches in America. You know? And I'm looking at this, I'm going, wow, the fun we've been having, the joy I've seen, the togetherness, the community, I love this place. And I love most of you. <laughs> I, won't, I won't say any names so. uh, but I, I, I think about that is that God provides despite the trials he does and James is telling Christians who live scattered among the nations who are under religious persecution poverty and general life difficulties that life has purpose of meaning and he's saying, guys, trust God. Put your faith in him and allow him to show up and do his thing his way. It may not be what you expected or how you expected, but it will be good and wise and ultimately best. And 
the other side is obvious. If we are duplicitous, then we never get to see God truly show up and do what he's able to do because we don't believe enough to let him go of our grip of control and see that God can do what he can do with all his magnificent wisdom. This big idea is furthered even more in verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. And I'm asking myself as I'm reading this, why would he say this? When you're part impoverished, starving, oppressed, or in enemy territory, why would you say that it's beneficial in any way? And what's the deal with pride? Why are humble circumstances in some way a high position? Well, throughout the scriptures, we're told that there's a heavenly reward for maintaining faith in difficult times. In fact, in the previous book, the book of Hebrews, we're told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is a big deal, and being faithful holds a big reward. But this is also saying something more. That the testing of faith during difficult circumstances and coming out the other side are also a reward unto itself. Character is developed in trying times. Character is developed in trying times. James is echoing what is shared by his brothers. I mean, Jesus said this in Matthew 5. We're blessed in the kingdom when we are persecuted or people say all types of false things about us. That upside-down thinking of difficult situations are actually places of blessing is repeated by Paul in 1 Peter chapter 4 and later even in this, this chapter and also in James 5. This, by the way, this opposes conventional thinking. I want you to consider our world for a moment. Say the wrong thing at the wrong time, you're canceled. Okay? Write something that opposes someone else's viewpoint and you'll be ridiculed online. Or even more philosophically, our world believes emotional well-being is largely tied to success, beauty, and ease of circumstances. And this is what makes James' thinking so upside down. He's celebrating that difficult and hard circumstances are actually a high position in God's kingdom. And if we stand the test and stay the course, we're actually doing exceedingly well. That we are in a high position in God's economy when we stay stable and don't let unbelief and doubt prevent us from the growth curve that difficulty provides. You see, in a very healthy way, we can have pride in the middle of difficult trials if we keep our eyes and our hearts focused on Jesus. This isn't a pride of arrogance, but rather a pride in our lowliness, knowing that in God's kingdom, there is a reward for staying true to him. Now, I'm going to say this, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but I don't think a lot of us in this room have that life. Many of us live a life that's very fortunate. We're, we love to say this word in culture blessed. Okay? If this idea of the impoverished seems far away from your life, he also has some advice for us. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. The sun rises with scorching heat and withers the planet. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even when they go about their business. Some of you know that I'm not much of a farmer. We own a little over 11 acres and each year. This stuff called grass grows. I'm actually, I, I personally feel like I master weeds, though. Um, I'm a little bit more capable of growing those. But I've watched, I've watched this, I've done cycles now. We grow in the hay, grow in the hay. You know what? It's not all that complicated. It's, it just grows. But you know what? It comes and it goes pretty quick. It just comes and goes quickly. It's like the snap of your fingers and the growing season is over and your grass is going to wither and it's going to die. And the point that James is making here is so you have money, so what? So what? What happens when the economy turns? What happens when the stock market crashes? What happens when the market doesn't need your business anymore? What happens when you have all the money you can possibly have and cancer or illness gets you? 
is point despite wealth. Trust God alone. Because at some point, at some circumstance, at some twist of fate, money will not and cannot be the solution. Only God is. James gives perspective to the struggling that their battle is a good fight. To develop their character for the glory of God. And then he warns the wealthy that riches are fleeting. And the only sure thing is God. So my question for you is, do you see the big picture? That no matter where you find yourself, God is what matters. And if you have faith in him and, res and resultantly receive wisdom from him, it is there that you discover the life of the kingdom that your soul longs for and your God wants you to have. To finish his opening perspective, James mimics his brother's Sermon on the Mount phrase in his own words. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Again, it takes this whole section full circle. James started by saying that there is joy in trials, and if we stay the course which requires perseverance, a much better outcome will remain. And here he concludes the outcome. When you are tested, when you are tried, when you have chosen to persevere in the name of Jesus, you will end up receiving a crown of life. Now in the Bible, there's actually multiple mentions about all different types of crowns. The crown of life is one variation. I think there's five different crowns mentioned in the Bible. I'm not going to get into that sort of message for another time. It would take us forever to get through all that. But here the crown of life is actually symbolic of the crown of martyrdom. That if you live through the disruption, chaos, and even death in this life and remain faithful, there is a unique and special blessing for staying faithful to the end. But this also hints at the universal blessing of all believers. And I wanted to end making that point with you today. That God has promised something very special for each and every one of us. And it is faith that gets us there. And I want you to hear these verses and just soak in them and let you be reminded that our God is good and his promises are good. Very, very good. First John 2 says, and this is what he promised us. Eternal life. He promised us that. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. What about 1 John 3? Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will have has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You want to go home and ponder something today? Ponder what it's like when the Son of God returns and we get to end up being like Him in all His glory. Oh, that should put a smile on your face. Good stuff. At the end of the Scriptures, uh, there's the one part of the Bible that's not past, but it's future. It's the book of Revelation, and it tells the prophetic future of what God's going to do. And, and, there, and, and in, in the third chapter, we read about those who are around the throne being celebrated. It says this, the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. It says, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. That the people who stay faithful to God, God promises <laughs> that Jesus himself will advocate an army half in front of God and all the angels. That's a promise. Or what about Revelation 21? And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is the throne room of God. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. Again, this is the promised future. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then maybe one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Isn't that incredible. 
is somehow, in some way, God not only gives eternal life, but he gives positions of authority and honor to those who stay the course when they are persecuted or stay faithful in all kinds of trials. They will not only just receive eternal life, but also, this is so interesting, the crown of life. Again, I don't know exactly know what that means. I'm not sure anybody does. But in Jesus' day, the crowns had signified four significant associations. Crowns were symbolized with royalty. Crowns also were signified with flowers. These crowns were worn in times of joy, like at weddings and feasts. There was also the crown that was a laurel. That was the wreath that would be given when you won the game. And then there was also the symbolic crowns, the crowns of dignity and honor and grace and glory. Hopefully this will make you smile. In my family, we understand about crowns. Man, I'm a king after all. Uh, but the truth is, our crown's a little different. We have a tiara. Uh, you may not know this, but in 1989, my wife was Miss Teen Illinois. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, she's probably gonna kill me later that I show this publicly. But we have her tiara from that time, and if you, if you were bold enough, strong enough, and mature enough to win a card game, game around our kitchen table, you get to end the game by wearing the, the crown, the tiara of the great show. And then you get a picture with your, you know, winning the game with the tiara. And I've, I've, I've been in that tiara quite often, I might add. Um, love to compete in our household, we do. Uh, it's a symbol. Nobody really knows for sure what the crown of life will mean in that heavenly realm. But I imagine it will be a symbol of those who endured hardship and stayed faithful despite persecution. I don't know if it's symbolic or actual. And I'm not really even sure it matters how our world looks at crowns, or, it's, or even tears for that matter. But I suspect that Jesus has every intention of rewarding those who stay faithful to him to the end. Church, all of us have trials. Busyness, health, insecurities, financial strains, relational mishaps, weariness, Family of origin trauma, work chaos, relational scarcity, and neighborhood disputes, just to name a few. Maybe, maybe, on rare occasions, some of us might even get a little tiny bit of persecution. Maybe. But we all have trials. So I want to finish this message with our challenge for the week. And, and I have a, just a question I want you to just be thinking through. As I want you to figure out what trial are you dealing with the most right now. That's going to be your homework. You just got to figure out what your trial is, okay? And then I want to encourage you to do what James said. Take that trial and then do it and deal with it in a biblical way. So here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. First, I want you to consider. What's that trial you have? And you're going to have to go home and do this. I want you to consider it. Consider the trial. Consider what's really going on. Seek and understand that maybe there's a different perspective you haven't thought of before. And then the second thing you're going to do, have joy. Choose joy. Let, let, let the joy of Jesus overwhelm you. It's not something you can manufacture. It's something you have to receive from Jesus. So you have to get close to the Spirit in order to have joy in the middle of chaos. And the third thing is, ask for wisdom. You can ask. God's not reluctant. God is not stingy. He's generous. But you have to ask him. You can't be unstable. You can't be double-minded. You have to say, God, I have to turn this over to you. Will you give me wisdom what to do? And then when he gives you the wisdom, do it. Do whatever he says to do. That's it. It's pretty simple, but it's really hard. It's simple to identify, and it's hard to choose to receive his joy and ask for his wisdom. Because we want to be in control but I want to say to you, trust the word of God on this one. It will change your life. Joy and wisdom are far, far better than anger and complaining. Amen? Okay. That's it. So that's week one on James. We're going to be going back over this for a couple months. We're going to go through every verse. We're going to process through this. But I want to give you an opportunity before we leave. And here's the statement I want you to hear. I want everyone in this church in a small group. Now let me say why. Biblical community. I believe everyone needs biblical community. I'm going to say this, and you're going to, I think you'll be able to mentally figure out what this is. You can't have biblical community staring at the back of someone's head for an hour a week. That's what you're doing right now. You're staring at the back of people's heads. 
You know what? What it requires are circles. What it requires are conversations. What it requires is getting to know people. Okay? Why are we doing small groups? Well, I'll, I'll give you a funny reason. You, you may go, oh, I go so we can grow as a church. You know what uh, my friend was telling me? He goes, the reason churches, the re reason why 85% of churches are 150 people or, or less, because that's all one pastor can handle. And what we have determined very early on is we don't want this to be about me. And I'll be honest with you, already with this group here, I can't take care of all of you. If you want somebody to truly take care of you, you have to be in a place where you can be loved and you can be known. Well, actually, you can be known and still loved. Maybe you see me that's way. Okay. Is, uh, but we, we believe that that happens best in the small. Why do we do this? Because the best part of the church is the small. Because I've been a pastor for 35 years. And since the 80s, I've been in small groups. All over the country and all the churches I've been a part of. And I would say this, the best part of what I get to do is be part of a small group. You know why? Because those are the people I love, those are the people I get to spend time with. We have deeper conversations, we pray for one another, we eat together, we just have more connection. And the truth of the matter is, I don't remember all the messages I wrote, I don't remember all the services I went to, but what I do remember are the friendships I have in those small groups, and they're what matters most. So I want to encourage you, if you can find a way, most people are like, oh, you don't understand my faith, you don't understand, I get it, I get it. If you can find a way, find a way to a small group. Now, how can you do that? There's some information I want you to have, it's actually Calvin's information. If you need to do right now, take a picture of this and contact Calvin. Calvin would have loved to have been here this morning, but he, he's with his wife, Patty, her mother's very sick and they're attending to her right now. But here's what's so funny. This is Calvin in, in, in a nutshell. He, I'm sitting there. I was praying this morning because that's my prayer board. That's what I'm supposed to pray. And um, I, I'm praying. And all of a sudden, I get a text from Calvin. Hey, I know you're, you're going to be announcing small groups this morning. I'm praying for that right now. I want to get to see our small groups pray. He wants to get people in small groups. We want you to be part of a community where you're known and still loved. Okay? You matter. And so we want you to get to the small groups. So if you have any questions, you can come and talk to me afterwards. But I, I want you to hear this from me. I know it's best when we have a space where Christians are with other Christians and they're having the real hard conversations and are able to engage God with one another, to love one another, to serve one another, because it's there that we're truly blessed. Amen? All right, Sam, we'll be closing prayer. Lord God, thank you that you want to give us joy. Thank you that you see our trials. And Lord, I'm really thankful that you offer wisdom to us. And you do it generously. So Lord, would you help us get past ourselves to be willing to ask over and over again that we need May we hunt for your wisdom. May, may there be a drive put in our, all of our souls that we want your wisdom. And may we pursue with everything we have so that your wisdom will just fill our lives. Make us the type of church that is full of wisdom and full of love. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.